Hello, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at exploring what's typical using sampling and design. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough-to-teach, tough-to-learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to introduce our two panelists for tonight, Diane Broberg and Jeff McCullough. Diane has been teaching high school mathematics for 25 years. She served on writing teams for Texas Instruments and taught many summer workshops. Making math come alive for teachers and students keeps her creative. Outside of math, she's an avid runner. Diane, thanks for joining us tonight. And Jeff co-founded the TI Inspire Super User Group with Bryson Perry. He teaches Algebra II and AP Statistics at St. Mary's Episcopal School in Memphis, Tennessee. In 2009, Jeff received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. Jeff authored a second edition of the TI Inspire for Dummies, as well as a second edition for the TID4 for Dummies. Jeff, thanks for being with us tonight. Hey, it's good to be here, and I'm not as fast a runner as Diane is. She's quite good. <laughs> We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time if you have questions for Diane or Jeff, go ahead and send those using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We're also going to be using the chat window tonight to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance as well as the documents that are being used tonight at the conclusion of the webinar. Once that recording is available, we'd love for you to follow along with that recording. That way you can go at your own pace. You can pause and rewind the recording as necessary. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. If that doesn't work, locate your name in the participant window and look for an icon that looks like a telephone. By clicking that icon, you'll automatically receive call-in information to use uh, a telephone. At this point, Jeff is going to discuss our agenda. Well, we're glad to be here. Um, today we're going to be talking about random sampling. <clears throat> and the, uh, we'll start with a question from the SAT. And we're going to build on commands not just in TI Inspire, but also in TI 4 And my guess is that tonight we'll talk about a couple of commands that you may not have used very much or even known they were there. And uh, they're really neat, so we're going to build a few things from scratch. We'll also use some activities from Math Inspired, which are already built for us. Um, as well as relating to the AP, um, both of us have taught AP STAT, and so uh, what will relate some of what we're learning um, there to the AP STAT classroom as well. And I love this, that you have a chance just by being on this webinar to win free stuff, because we're teachers, and who doesn't like free stuff? And the best would be to be able to go to the international conference uh, or get a free registration for that. So that's always a possibility. Thanks, Jeff. And Diane is going to discuss our expected outcomes. Diane, are you there? Um, well, first of all, we're going to examine the two types of inference and look at some of the obstacles that come with each, the bias and confounding. Uh, we're going to work on demonstrating some random sampling, some lists, and some inspire. We'll also check in with the before. Um, we're going to that illustrate the how, the when, and the why, and how you can use some of these things using with stratification and blocking. And finally, we're going to try to do some good data collection um, using both AP and SAP. Thanks, Diane. Diane, you're now the presenter, and feel free to share your desktop. Okay. Can with an SAT question. Uh, one that 
Steph and I have that, that about polling adults. Um, so can you see this in your chat window? So are you satisfied? Well, let's, with, let's see if we're, I can't see the, uh, let, just a second. Let's, uh, the, uh, are you sharing your desktop? I think yes, it's I coming am. through slowly. It's, uh, oh. it's taking its time tonight. Can you share my screen? Boy, um, I hate when technology slows down a little, doesn't it? So, Diane, I'm going to take control back for a second. I'm going to okay. Just, oh, wait, never mind. It looks like it just came through. Okay. Jeff, do you see Diane's screen? I do. I do. Okay. We're, we're, we're good, good to go. go. Now. So, this is an SAT question. And, um, you know, the SAT has got more stats on it now than it ever did before since they redesigned it about three years ago. And so if you would just take a second and read this question, and then you're going to get a poll that's going to come um, to your screen there, I believe. And you can click actually more than one answer. So you're allowed to click, you know, one, two, three, or four, or one, two, three, and four, although that would be tough to be none and all the others. So if you look on your side screen, Read the question and answer it just for a second here. I could read it out loud. A polling agency recently surveyed 1,000 adults who were selected at random from a large city and asked each of the adults, are you satisfied with the quality of the air in the city? Of those surveyed, 78% responded they were satisfied with the quality of the air in the city. Based on the results of the survey, which of the following statements must be true? So click the, so the answers that must be true. What, do your students have trouble with the SAT questions? Uh, Diane, you've, you've asked this in your classroom. How, how, did, how do they do on these kinds of questions? Just a regular Algebra two yeah. student or something? I have trouble with some of the multiple choice. What do you think, Mike? Why don't you uh, put, take that, uh, let's see the results of that poll. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. I know some people are still uh, still working on it, but uh, for the sake of time tonight, we're going we're gonna to move pretty quickly. So um, Jeff and Diane, don't forget, whenever I close the poll, I need about 20 seconds. Okay. while it's waiting for final responses. So we have about 15 seconds. Okay. I know that my um, students um, particularly have a really difficult time because they they tend to read and they'll just sort of look at a few numbers and then look for answers with yeah. those numbers and they don't necessarily read really carefully, which on the SAT, uh, that's that's a pretty tough thing. So yeah, I, I mean, can share this, the if you have an, results. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So 6%, 8%, and then the majority picked the correct answer, uh, which was uh, D, 4. So I, I think, you know, and when I talk to my students about questions like this, I'm happy when they get the right answer, but I'm even, um, I'm more pleased when they can explain why each one is wrong. Um, so like in this, for this, for a stats question like this, of all the adults in the city, 78% are satisfied with the quality of the air. Um, and can we make that statement for sure? Well, with stats, we can never really make any statement for sure. We, we have this confidence interval, we, you know, we're 95% confident. We might have a, you know, in a range of values there that we might be, feel comfortable with. But to say it's exactly 70% seems too firm there. And number two, if another 1,000 else were selected, then 78% of them would report they're satisfied we don't really have insurances that will be the same exact percentage. It's a different uh, group of folks there. And same thing for number three. It's also a different group from a different city. So there could be differences in the uh, makeups of the city, uh, kind of their, their attitudes towards things. So the only one we know for sure there, I think, would be the, the last answer, which is none. And that's typical. So uh, just the idea of sampling um, it's something that all of our students in math classes, if they're taking the SAT or PSAT, which is coming up in just a few weeks, you know, they need to be prepared for just a basic sampling kind of question like that and be able to eliminate some bad answers there. Let's go the other way on that. 
Hey, Jeff, we lost Diane completely. Okay. So, do, you, um, do you need to give it over to me? Yeah, well, I'll give you control, and I think uh, those slides uh, should be should be good. So I think we just did slide eight, the SAT question. Okay. Um, let me let me get back to here. I can get this. I'm gonna give her a quick phone call. Okay. So am I sharing my screen? I haven't shared my screen yet, right? No, you're not. Here you might not need to right now, but you can if you want to. Okay. Okay, so we are um, now talking about two different things here. So we have observational studies and experiments, and we're really contrasting the two. Um, so there, there really is a difference in purpose between the two, and, and so like an observational study, you're taking a random sample of uh, folks, um, and you're trying to draw an inference about the population. So it's kind of like a, I think of it like, a, I tell my students it's like a taste of ice cream. Right, so you're tasting some ice cream. You don't know what the flavor is, and you're tasting it, and you're trying to guess what the flavor is of the ice cream you're tasting, but you only have a small taste of that ice cream. And that's, that's what we're doing with the observational study. We're taking a random sample. We're trying to draw some kind of inference, usually like what's the mean um, of something or the median of something. We're trying to make an inference about the population. Um, with, with observational studies, um, the challenge is we have some lurking variables. Sometimes there are things behind the scenes that are affecting our studies. And sometimes a stratified sample instead of just a simple random sample. Um, and, and that's what we're talking about a lot tonight. We're gonna to talk about, we're actually gonna do this. We're gonna take a stratified sample. We're gonna show you how to do that, that with uh, one of the documents we're doing. And then in contrast to that are experiments. So experiments are a whole different animal. The purpose is a little bit different. So. With an experiment, you're not taking a random sample. You you kind of have a group there. You've already taken the sample, whoever is in the experiment's a sample, and then you're randomly assigning within the group. So maybe half the group gets the drug, half the group doesn't have the, you know, has a placebo drug. You're looking for ideas like replication control. And the purpose really, and this is kind of interesting, is we're trying to prove a cause and effect with an experiment. So you can't really do that for the most part with observational studies. And we're going to talk a lot tonight about this idea of confounding variables. It's a very confusing topic. You could almost think of the word confounding as confusing sometimes for students. And so we'll try to uh, shed some light on what a confounding variable is. Um, and that's one of the purposes of tonight's lesson. And then we'll also get to a little bit of blocking, which is um, another way of reducing variation, although a lot of people think that prevents confounding. It's really still reducing variability, which makes our estimates more precise in a way. And so I want you to do one more question here. I'll wait, wait for Diane to get back on here. And this is a compact, uh, this is another SAT question, um, I believe. And you have a poll that just came up that you can answer. And I'll just read the, the first part of it, and then you can read the answers. A compact disc, a CD manufacturer, wanted to determine which of the two cover designs for a newly released CD will generate more sales. So the manufacturer chose 70 stores to sell the CD. 35 of these stores were randomly assigned to sell CDs and one of the cover designs, and the other 35 were assigned to sell the CDs with the other color, cover design. The manufacturer recorded the number of CDs sold at each of the stores found a significant difference between the mean number of CDs sold for the two cover designs. Which of the following gives the conclusion that should be based on the results provided, provides the best explanation for the conclusion? So take a second and read some of those answers and then respond to the poll. So it Jeff, like I just wanted to, yeah, yeah. I was just gonna give you a Diane update. She's back on. Um, Diane, just so you know, you're muted uh, in WebEx, so just click that red microphone to the right of your name. Diane, I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. Diane, can you, can you hear, hear me, me now? 
Yep. yep. Can you guys hear oh, me? Oh, so much better now. You're, there was something wrong with your connection before. So, so now you're you're looking really good there. Okay. That's great. I'm we appreciate it. Yeah, you're back and better than ever. Okay. So, um, just give them another. They're just read. They, we just read this question and they're looking at the answers of this SAT question. And it has a little different flavor than the last one. Mike, why don't you uh, go ahead and close the poll on this? Okay. You know, the average the average time that students get for an SAT question is about a minute and 20 seconds uh, for a question. So in my class, sometimes I'll just close the poll, um, whether they're done or not, uh, just to, to show them, you know, to say, hey, you have a limited amount of time, this is a standardized test. And so it's a way of kind of getting them to move a little bit faster on some of these questions. Because that's, that's part of the tough part is, is, is answering in a good amount of time. And here we have the results. Um, some people didn't answer in the time period. Uh, the most popular answer was D. And let's see, Diane, is that the right answer? It is reasonable to conclude the difference in sales was caused by the different cover designs because the cover designs were randomly assigned by this to the stores. What I do you think, think about that's that exactly answer? Right. I think that's a good answer. Right. So the big difference between this question and the previous question, this is now an experiment. And so the idea of uh, the purpose of proving cause and effect is okay to say because it's an experiment. And that's something that students need to, to understand. The main difference between, you know, a, a random sample and, and then um, an experiment, an observational study and experiment. Diane, I'm going to um, go ahead and give you um, control so we okay. get to our first activity here. Yeah, so you can share your screen. Good. Yeah. Did you send it over because I can't click? I, you have the ball, so you have to go to quick start and then share your screen. I did that. It won't let me share. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Jeff, would you be able to do some sharing tonight? Sure. Sure. So Can you Diane move the ball over to me? Yep. It's on its way. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so um, let's get back to our PowerPoint. So today um, we're going to talk about this idea of random sampling, and we're going to use a command called RANSAMP. It's one of the most interesting commands TI Inspire has. It's not available on the TI-84, the RANSAMP command. Interestingly, we're going to talk about a command on TI-84 later that does a similar thing, but it's not available on the TI Inspire. So again, these are somewhat obscure commands, but if you haven't seen how they work, um, I, I think you're kind of missing out. And so that's one of our goals of tonight's session is, is to um, kind of show you how some of these uh, things work. And and I, I think you're gonna appreciate it. Um, it it's kind of neat. So uh, Diane, what we wanna do here is um, we wanna, create a list of numbers. So we're going to randomly sample from a group of numbers. So I'm going to go just like an Excel. This has like a formula bar here in a list and hey, spreadsheet Jeff. page. Hey, yeah. Jeff, can you do me a favor and share your screen? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Sorry. I got it. There we go. Okay, so if you um, so so Jeff, what you so, need to do is you need to start at the start at the top of the page. Yeah. It's it's always there important we when we're working with a list that we label yeah. it or give it a name. Sure. What are we going to call the first list? Well, how would you call it? Sure, that's a great name. Numbers. Okay. So we're just going to select from a group of numbers. And that's a good thing to do is you go ahead and select, um, you know, call the One thing I never do, always call it more than one letter when you call the list um, a variable. Because these, these lists are actually, the columns are A, B, C, D. And so if you just call it one letter, um, sometimes the, the calculator gets confused. 
In the equation bar, if you click there, it's got an equal sign, and you can put a command there. Um, the sequence command, I'd like to just uh, generate a sequence of numbers. I don't remember where the sequence command is. Do you, Diane? Oh, I think what if you hit, well, there's two ways to get it. One, if you hit, if you just type the letters SEQ for sequence, you can always get it. I don't, okay, I like so you that could always, it will always get you there. And if Other you forget you where get, a command is, do you ever use the catalog? The catalog. See this? So you can hit this book looking thing, and if you go to uh, hit the S key and go down to sequence, the nice thing about doing the catalog is it actually tells you the syntax of the command. So it says expression, comma the variable, low, high, and what their step needs to be. So I'm gonna click the sequence. I guess it's X, comma, X, comma. Let's go from one to 30. Uh, one to 30, okay. So it should generate. It, okay, do I have to say ones or will it default to one? Well, you don't have to, but I think it definitely helps students if you tell them that if they know they're going to count by ones because it helps them when they're using this sure. for other commands. Okay. So there it generates a list of 30 numbers, which is nice. And, and so you have 30 numbers that were generated uh, very quickly. Um, so then what are we going to do with those numbers? We want to uh, randomly sample um, some of those numbers. So I want to randomly sample some of those. So there's a command for random. So should I name the column first? Yep, let's call that sample. I'm going to call it sample. And so again, I just click in here or click equals and you have your command. You can see what I'm typing down here if you're having trouble seeing it up there. And there's a rand samp command. Um, if you don't know where so, it is, you can hit the catalog. Do you know where the command is? I think if you hit menu. Okay. And if you go over to. Ooh, data. Six, yeah. Go down to random. And go down to and, sample, right? Yeah, number five will give it to you. And so I want to uh, randomly sample uh, from the list uh, numbers. So I could either uh, type the word numbers or hit the variable key and choose numbers. So I want to select from that. And how many numbers should I choose here randomly? Oh, how Four, about we choose five? five? Okay. So I'm going to press comma five. So that should randomly select five uh, numbers from that list. And it, and it did. Um, hey, if you want you know to keep... You got, you yeah. got the six twice. Oh, I got so six it, twice. Oh, no. Yeah. That's, that's rough. So is there a way to, I wonder if there's a way to uh, not get any repeats? Um, I think it's, I think you can do that because I think there's two options. Two options are either one, it selects it with repeats or it selects it without repeats. The default, if you it, put nothing in there, it's going to do it with repeats. So if you'd like to do it without so, repeats, you have to put a comma. Yeah. And then the number one means it'll do it with no repeats. And I just want to show you uh, what we're talking about. It actually in the catalog shows you uh, that you say the list, the number of trials, which is five, and then do you want repeat? It says zero is with replacement. That's the default. Uh, but if you don't want replacement, you can hit uh, number one. So I'm going to hit comma one here. And what should happen is now when the list is generated, it won't have a repeat in there, right? And in fact, I could keep redoing this. You can hit Control R on your computer or calculator, and it'll generate um, additional lists here, and you'll never see a repeat in each of these five numbers that you're choosing randomly because we selected uh, no repeats there. Okay, it'd be nice to do something with this data, right? To maybe, uh, what, do you, what do you think, Diane? What, what should we do next? How about if we work on trying to find a sample mean? Okay. So, so I should I do that in a cell? You want to do that in a cell and not a list. If you do it in a list, then it's just going to populate the entire list with the same number. So if right here yeah, you define yeah. something, so let's type in equal here. Now again, okay. by now I think we know we want a mean, so let's use the word this time. Okay. And one of the things I like just... is when you type it, you know that it is defined when it stands up straight for us. So it's a so word when I hit that the goes N. Like oh, yeah. No? I see. Yep. And, and so, so I want the mean. mean 
of the sample. Of the sample. And when I press enter, it says the mean cool. is 20. Very nice. And if I, if I, you know, keep, uh-oh, wait, what, what's that? I just hit control well, R. Yeah, we got that so 97. My students don't like that, Jeff. Can we get rid of the decimal point? Can we get rid of the decimal yes. point for non-fraction? So, you kind of do the same thing you used to do on a TI-89 if you've been around TI for a while. If you hit times one point, like put a decimal point in there somewhere, it'll automatically return a decimal every single time. So that's, that's good. I do that on a calculator screen as well. Like if, if I don't want a decimal, I'll just put a decimal in your problem and you'll always return a decimal. There's other ways to do it, but that's just an efficient way. Of doing it. Okay, That's so I can take, I can hit Control R and get many different sample means. Like it ranges all the way from 12 up to 20 sometimes, or 11. So 24. Is, wow. Yeah, that was high. So That's we're good. just picking five numbers out of a list, and um, you know sometimes it's where you might expect, and sometimes it's, it's a, like 24 was a pretty high mean there. So I'd like to plot this. I like to actually. I would like to make what's called a sampling distribution, right, with okay. what we're doing here. So so I want to so, collect this data somehow. Yep. So let's go up to the top. Let's name the list again. Let's call it okay. plot. Oh. So it'll give us the data. Let's go over in letter D. Oh, letter D is plot. Okay. Yep. Let's call that plot. And what we want to do is we want to catch those numbers. So we want that 12.2. We want to be able to catch that. To be able to catch it, I yeah. first of all have to define it or I have to store it somewhere. So go grab it, and then if you hit Control and Store, which is right above your variable key, yeah. it'll give you the option. Let's call that, let's call it Sample Mean, or S-A-M-P, or call it S-Mean for Sample Mean. Give it some name you like. About, okay, S-Mean, I like that. Oh, okay. wow, it got so all bold notice, and dark. It's bolded, which means it's a defined variable now. So we're gonna try to collect yep. all those guys. So if you now go over and right there, if we want to capture these things, so if we hit yep. menu and you go to data, it's not highlight. Wait, I know what you got to do, Jeff. Escape back out for a minute. Go back and don't put any, don't put plot. Hit escape, get rid of everything in your, that little key. Now go back and hit menu. Oh, no equal sign this time. No equal sign. Got to go down to data now. Okay. And ah, you would like to capture it. there to capture. Yeah. And now you have two choices, automatic it? or manual. You'd like us to do this automatic, automatically, because then every time yeah. you get a new number, it will populate the screen. So oh, that's there. what I want. It says, it says variable. It's a variable. So you want and to I want sample mean. The S mean. Yep. Sample mean. Yep. And that little one down there, what that is, that's telling you that it is capturing it automatically. The other number that could be down there is a zero. Oh, if it's a zero, that means okay. you have to do it manually. Hitting control decimal to collect it manually. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, if you, so it populated with 12.2. So is. if I hit control R again, you get a new sample okay. mean and it populates that list. This is pretty neat. It does. But it's, okay. it's actually making a sampling distribution right there. It is. It's, the, it's getting all of your means. Let's, so can we do a quick graph? Yeah, I can do a quick graph. Yeah. So hit menu. Oh, it's not a choice. Huh. So, yeah, you got to go back one, back one row over to the left. You got to be in your right column and then do it. So now if, if you hit oh. menu. There we go, quick there graph. You go. So if you're in that I'm column. I'm in the right column when you do it. Oh, neat. And so you can even adjust these if you needed to. Yeah, you can change your window. So I can even, yeah, I'm going to show a computer view so you can see a little bit more of this. And so if I hit Control R again, it collects another data point here. So Control R. And each one and you select, it plots for you. I want to make sure I have, there might be some off the screen here. Let me see this. Ah, I thought there might be. So I there like, could be some smaller you, than 10. Right. If you actually do it the first time, if you do it before, if you do your quick plot before you do a whole bunch of numbers, 
It will give yeah. you a window that's going to give you the entire, it will give you the best window possible. Oh, wow. Yep, I've learned that over lots of trial and error. Yeah. So we could collect a, a lot more bits of data, and each time we collect, it builds this sampling distribution. It's getting a new mean every time and adding that. Ah, I mean, it's so neat that you can just do this in a few steps. Yeah, um, and, I think and with this webinar, you can always look back on this if you had trouble following some of those steps. And the really cool part is it doesn't matter what data you put in there, you can do this with lots of different data. So I've done it in yeah. class. Um, I've done it in class using data that I have gotten from football players, from how many yeah. touchdowns they scored. I have done it from collecting the number of chocolate chips that we had in cookies um, so that we can look at sampling distributions and see what happens to their means. It's a pretty powerful tool because every student gets different results every single time. Let me ask you this. So, I mean, we don't have to do it right now, but if I wanted to put Tom Brady in here, you know, and some other quarterbacks, uh, you know, Aaron, I guess Aaron Rodgers, can, can, a, can a RAN SAMP command pick oh, – from, it can from, choose, from words, like names? It can choose from people. So sometimes I put my classes, my whole class list in there, and if I need two oh, people wow. to present or two people to do something, you can randomly generate two people for me also. And you could have it do it with no repeat or with repeat if you wanted to pick on the same kid, potentially. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so they, when someone has they to have to stay on their toes. Them. So yep. you could have a list here and use the RANSAMP command to choose students' name on who you're going to call on. That's just, it's kind of a neat command. It, it has a lot of, um, I, don't, I think a lot of people haven't seen that command, but it's, it's neat for building a sampling distribution, but also just I think it has some other uses in the classroom that could be, that could be kind of neat to use. Okay. Hey, Jeff. Um, I, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Before you guys move on to your next piece, I just want to um, remind people if they're having any audio issues, uh, that maybe the best way to resolve that is if they find their name in the participant window and look for that phone icon. If they click that phone icon in the participant window, it will give them information to call in using their phone, which should resolve uh, any audio issues. Sorry for the interruption. Thanks so much. No problem. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's move on to um, this next thing, which is, so the 84 has a, has a command as well um, that, that's available to it, to us. Um, let me see. I'm just gonna start my smart view there. So this, it's called rand int no repeat. And uh, this is interesting because it's not a command on TI Inspire. Right, so the random ran it no repeat is not on TI Inspire. It's a special command only for 84. And would you agree with this, Diane? It kind of does a similar thing that the ran samp command does. What do you think about that? Diane, you there? So I want that. If you don't. Oh yeah, you're back now. There you are. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. What do you think about that? The, uh, the this ran temp, this ran in no repeat is kind of similar to the ran samp command on TI Inspire. It, it is. It is. Again, we can do the exact same thing that we can randomly generate a list of numbers um, looking at a set of integers, and again, it does it with no repeats, which is kind of nice for us. Yeah. So, so how do I get to that it? command? Because I, yeah. I think you got to start with math. If you go over to probability. And, oh, there it is. And right at the there bottom. Yeah. Okay. And so, oh, it has a wizard for it. That's so nice. I love that on, on 84 when it has a wizard for things. Um, and, and Inspire does this as well so that you don't have to, if you get it from the menu, it'll, it'll, it kind of walks you through it so you don't have to remember all the different syntax for things. It's very so helpful. lower bound. I could say one, upper bound, um, 30, and say I want to choose uh, five um, numbers, and it's no repeat, so there should not be a repeat here. It's going to randomly sample and generate a list of uh, five numbers, and if I 
press enter again, it'll generate five new numbers, press enter again, it'll gen generate five more. So effectively, you could, in your classroom, if you have 84s, um, if you have data that's in boxes number one through 36, they could select a random sample, you know, of those 36 yeah. boxes by using this command, and then they could just, you know, do you do that in your class where sometimes the students, you know, figure out the mean of those numbers by hand, right? Do you ever do that? I do sometimes, but I there's a nice command here. You can do that also. You can do a mean. Oh, okay. How do I get to that command? Is it part of this math yeah. command? No, try statistics. Uh, okay. I think you want to calculate. Oh, no. I got you the wrong way. It, Let's try second in list. There you go. And second now list, that is the list, and there it is. Yeah. And there's the mean. There it is. And so if I now, copy and paste this list, if I mouse up and press enter, ooh, didn't work, did it? So what I, I typically I, do is I typically store it. Oh, okay. So you have to store that. Yeah. So, so if you use the. So, yep. So store it in so, list L1. Okay. And hit enter. And now if you put it, type your mean command. And the mean is number three. And you and want to mean of L1. L1. Ah, so it will, it will calculate that for you. Yep. So it, it's just a few more steps, but you could have them uh, calculate and create a sampling distribution on Inspire using this command, rand int no repeat. Um, again, you could use it to call on students if you have a, the desk numbered um, or something like that. Um, so yep, or you can have, that, you can have a list in a data, um, data in a list, and you can choose those numbers out of it also. So I, I just read this, and I want to see if this works. So I'm going to hit, because uh, one of the comments I was reading said maybe I could try this. Let's go back to uh, second list uh, just to try it, because I, I think it would work. So mean, if I go up to the command instead of the answer there, so if I go up to ran int and put that in there, it will find the mean. It just won't show the actual numbers. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting. Yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about doing that, but it doesn't show the five numbers, but it shows you the mean of the five numbers. Um, so I like the visual of having the five numbers there. Um, but I think that was a really neat idea uh, for, for Maria uh, to, to suggest that. I think it was her or someone did there. Uh, but that was a neat, neat little thing there. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, so that's that's kind of the equivalent of that command. That's how you can do some of this stuff um, with, with built-in commands. Now, this is a TI Inspire activity called Stratified Sampling. It's part of Math Inspired. And uh, it basically kind of, if you read this, it kind of gives you a flavor of what it's about. Um, the ice cream company, you know, the good old fashioned, you know, trucks are going around to neighborhoods trying to sell ice cream, and they're trying to be strategic about it and find out where the kids are. And, you know, um, they're trying to survey, do a survey of a whole bunch of city blocks, 36 city blocks, and find out, um, kind of sample them and find out you know, which areas are the best areas to sell the ice cream in. I would imagine if you have more kids in that area, it'd be easier to sell the ice cream. So let me show you what this document looks like on Inspire. So um, I'm gonna go back to a handheld here and go to stratified sampling. So this is the uh, command here. And if you've never seen this, um, this is something called RANC. It gives us some instructions here. It says we're supposed to um, fill in a number that's unique to you. Diane, why do we need to fill out the RAND seed here? Why don't we just start this activity uh, right out of the box and just start it? Why do we need to have a unique number for RAND seed here? Well, any random number generator is an algorithm written by someone from a computer. And so every algorithm starts with a number. And so if we do this, and actually it's kind of fun the first time I do it in class, is I don't look at the uh -huh. seed, and we just see what and happens. What, what happens we if they don't the seed? We all get the same result. And then then it's that shock of, uh-oh, this is supposed to be random. And they have the exact same pattern I do. So then if we go in and we ran seed it, the comical thing is sometimes they want to do the same number that I've just chosen. Yeah. So we did yeah. talk about so how you, doing it. Everyone's got to do their own. 
So I usually tell them something like the last four digits of your phone number or something. So I'm going to do the last four digits of my phone number and press enter. So it doesn't do anything, but it's now seeded. That that's where the random numbers are going to start generating from. And this is the first page of the document, and um, I like to click things and see what happens. And so if you click this, it looks like it chooses kind of a simple random sample of, what, six of the boxes of the 36 um, square blocks on this, in this city. And what it's recording here, for you is the number of children that are in each of the box. And then oh, it's number of children. Okay. So there's the number of children in each of those boxes. And then on the right-hand side up top, it, it plots those points. The vertical line is the mean, and it okay. will plot that below in the green. That's the mean of the sample. Okay, so if I click it again, it chooses a new, a slightly different mean, although it's pretty close. There. Well, it chooses there. a different sample is what we'd like it to do. Yeah, so if it did yeah. that, we just yeah. got lucky that we're the same twice. What, what happens if I click the left arrow? Oh, wow, it starts over. But I kind of I kind of like that. Okay, so I'm going to take a sample, and so right down here, this is our sampling distribution, right? So each time we take a sample of six uh, six square blocks, it finds the sample mean and plots it down here. Now, so if I for keep, a second. you do get some of the same numbers, like you notice you had 261, you had 217. So this, there are some repeats in there because these are all just based on how many how many children live in each of the blocks. Oh, yeah, because there could be the same number, like 47 live in that block and that block, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, block, the blocks aren't changing. It's just the sampling is. We're sampling different uh, groupings of the 36 blocks. Yeah. Uh, one thing I like about this, it does it quite quickly for students so they can get lots of samples. Each student's little yeah. green um, graph should be a little bit different, and we also can see kind yes. of what's yeah. happening. Oh, I do like that. So I like having real data, and so the fact that each student's uh, graph is a little different is okay with me. Um, and again, each time you're you're adding to this. So I've I've had a 25. Is that a good number? I think 25 is an excellent number to start with. Okay. So let's go to the next page and see what's happening here. It looks like they've put vertical bars here, maybe in pink. And so, so when I, is... yeah. What it's doing this time is this time it's stratifying the sample, and it's stratifying the sample with a vertical. So it is, it's in each block we have people at a similar distance from the freeway. And so the question is, is this a good way to stratify the sample? Should we do this if, we're, right. if well, our whole goal is that we're going to make good truck decisions um, where we should put our drivers? Is this the way we should do it? Right, because you're saying like every – if you're close to the highway, you get one that's really close to the freeway, and then one that's you know a little bit further away, and a little bit further away, and you get one that's you know see it's, it's all spread out in relationship to the freeway. Yep. And so just looking at this, you're getting all kinds of different numbers. I'm not sure if the mean is any better or not. It's hard to say right now. It is. Let's see what happens. Um, Keep collecting your 25 days of the data. Let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. So I've got so, 25 of those. There's my sampling distribution. Yeah, so we'll go back and turn back the page. Let's see if we notice the difference. Are they similar or yet different? Oh. Okay, so this one goes from better. about 20, 25 to 50, somewhere in that range. And this one goes from about 20 to 50-ish. So this so one's a little kind bit more different. spread out maybe. So maybe maybe this one's a little bit more spread out. Maybe that wasn't a good so way I don't, to stratify. I don't think that was a good way to stratify. Let's so see. Let's, let's see. The maybe. Other we, way. Okay. Let's try downtown. So now we're horizontally, we're stratifying in relationship to downtown here. Yes, which means that we're looking at all the people in the first row with a similar distance from downtown, and we're doing the same thing. We're going to take one person from one block from each row. Do you know? Do you see what I see? It's easier to see the pattern here. Uh, the closer you are to downtown, it looks like the more children there are in this particular city. Like 56 here, 53 as you get further away. So this could be a really good way of stratifying. Wow, look at that graph. 
there's not yeah, I, nearly as much variation. It's we're working with still six blocks that we're randomly selecting, but because we stratified by something that is making a big impact here, look at this data. It's all between 30 and 40. Wonder what the next page shows. Oh, look at this. So this is the simple random sample, which had a median of 38.5, and then we took we stratified by the freeway. And that's a median of 35, and then we sampled by the relationship to downtown stratified, and that was 35.16. Which one of these medians would be the best estimate here? Well, or the means. Cool part these is, are all means, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The, no, those are all medians, but they're they're medians that are sample means. But the cool part is, if we right. look at the medians are fairly similar, but the boxes are a lot different. And and when we talk about sampling distributions and why we stratify things, one of our goals with stratification is to have less variability, and that's one of the reasons right. that we choose to do it. And so all of a sudden, students can really see it instead of me just explaining it. They can see. What a difference right. it made if I stratified one way versus the other way. And I think one thing we sometimes do as teachers is we just tell them the way to stratify it, and we don't ever investigate and see, hey, what happens if I do it, do it a, a good way, and what happens if I do it a, a less good way? And this really yeah. nicely shows what happens, and it shows the goal of stratification, which is to reduce variability in our sampling distribution. Which, right, which makes our estimates more precise. Um, and there's not as, it's not as risky of making a bad decision. So I've used this with my students also. I think you have too, Diane. And it's it's a powerful. I mean, it, it, it's it's them seeing the results of wow, stratification is a really good thing to do when you find a variable that makes a difference there. Like stratification by the wrong variable doesn't help at all, as we saw in this example, right? The, the yeah. freeway didn't help at all. Yeah, this is one of those times when I get those aha moments from students in class that all of a sudden the other light bulb goes on that they actually understand right. what I'm talking about because they've seen it happen versus hearing me tell it happen. Right, right. So I agree. I think I think that's a, that's a really uh, good way to go there. Um, let's look at this. So blocking um, an experiment. So let's see. Oh, so what? What is your definition? So we want to ask in the chat window because I can I can tell we've got some experts here, we've got some people who have some really good ideas. What is the definition of confounding? Can you kind of in the chat window um, talk about a definition of confounding? Difficult to do. I know it's a difficult concept to talk about students with this idea of confounding. Thomas says, oh. a variable whose effects cannot be distinguished from the treatment variable. Uh, he says, I'm uh, not sure. Yeah. I understand. Juanita says, oh, when an unmeasured variable is causing the effect on a, on a response variable. So, Jeff, I did a little research, and I went on and okay. I read a whole bunch of things about what confounding actually is. Uh, and sure. I think that, that's, that's kind of where we get at. It's this concept that sometimes we mix things up. We don't know which um, is actually yeah. distinguished between the effects that we're having um, between one variable and the other. And that's a hard thing for students to figure out, is, is right. sometimes it's an extra variable we don't understand, we didn't account for. Um, it can ruin an experiment. Um, right. Unless we actually see that what it actually is doing for us, and so confounding is, is a topic that is is continues to be stressed on the AP exam, and it's one of those topics that's difficult for students to kind of figure out when they're looking at questions. Yeah. So in your research, uh, which ones of these did you really like? Which one of these definitions did you think, wow, that, I, I hadn't really thought about it that way? Or well, one of my favorites because it's easiest for sometimes I think it's easiest for my students is when we the concept of confounding, if I think about it in the English language, it's that concept of mixing things up. And so I yeah. like uh, the definite the dictionary definition I actually think is one that my students really understand and can connect with. Yeah. Oh, so mix up. Mix up something with something yeah. else so that individual elements become difficult to distinguish, right? 
um, it's, it's an extra variable you didn't account for. Um, it, the results are ruined. Um, huh, that's interesting. Um, a variable other than the independent variable that you're interested in that may affect the dependent variable. So it's having some effect on your experiment. It's confounding the results here. Um, and so I think I think it's a tough concept for students to get. They, we we have long discussions, and I know this happens in my class sometimes. You know, they ask questions I'm not even sure about how to answer because it's it's difficult when you start talking about this kind of stats. It's different than regular math, I think. Um, this this stats is a whole new animal for me to teach. Did you find that true also? I do, I do, and then as I look at this chat window, then there's lurking variables. The lurking variables are another variable we we encounter. Um, when we're talking yes. about statistics. And so I think they are challenging. Hey, can you show them the question we found? Sure. Got, so this got... is, um, yeah, this is uh, an, the AP uh, free response question. In 1999, um, the dentist and dental clinic would like to determine if there's a difference between the number of new cavities in people who eat an apple a day and the people who eat less than an apple, one apple a week. They were going to conduct a study with 50 people in each group. 50 clinic patients who reported that they routinely eat an apple a day, and 50 clinic patients who report they eat less than one apple a week will be identified. The dentist will examine the patients and their record to determine the number of new cavities and patients have had over the past two years. Then they will compare the number, number of new cavities in the two groups. Explain the concept of confounding in the context of this study, including an example of confounding variable. So what is an example, because we wanted to talk about an AP question that, I mean, they ask, what is, this, what is the confound, what is a possible confounding variable here? So if you want to answer that question in the chat window, we would love for you to do that. I think this is an interesting question for statistics students because there's more than one right answer, and we're so uh -huh. used in math class that there being one right answer. So this is a hard question uh. for students because they have to, like, really think about things. Yeah. So some people are saying other types of food, um, socioeconomic levels, um, poor dental hygiene, fluids that were consumed, other foods that were consumed, um, could be another variable affecting things. Lying. <laughs> Michael <laughs> Brown doesn't trust one. his students very much. <laughs> Time of day that they eat things. Um, the Zerkley amount of candy, I'm not sure what Zerkley means, but uh, candy uh, consumption could be uh, a difference instead of apples. Uh, Chris True, by the way, said that. I know you know him. Yeah. Yeah, so, so these are all really good examples of things that, that can confound and things that students have to actually think about as they're doing it, as they're looking at it. So. Um, the question continued, and this was really kind of interesting, and we're going to send out a poll, a yes-no poll here. Uh, but the question, part C of this question said, if the mean number of new cavities for those who ate an apple a day was statistically significantly smaller than the mean number of new cavities for those who ate less than one apple a week, could one conclude that the lower number of new cavities can be attributed to eating an apple a day. So we want you to answer yes or no to the poll here. This is kind of bringing together some of the things we've been talking about this, um, this webinar. This might be our last question, actually. Okay, go ahead and close the poll, uh, Mike, and we're going to see in a minute uh, what the results will be for this. I think students, my guess is students had some trouble on this question, um, and it was probably based on their understanding of, is this an observational study or is this an experiment? That's the underlying thing that's really important here. Um, if you look back on the question, is this an experiment or an observational study? What do you think, Diane? What is this? Well, I think it's probably going to be an observational study because I don't think they changed anything. Yeah, they just kind of picked people who, they're not, there's no treatment that was imposed. Correct. Or there has to be random assignment with an experiment. Does that make sense? So random assignment 
It doesn't seem like they were randomly assigned to eat apples or not eat apples. So it's an observational study. So could we prove cause and effect with an observational study? Because that's basically, is that kind of what it's asking here? It is. Mean numbers. Could one conclude that lower number of new cavities can be attributed to eating apple a day? It's saying, could we say that something is causing another thing to happen? And the purpose of experiments is to prove cause and effect. Observational studies, we can't prove cause and effect generally. So I think the answer is no, as 66 of our uh, participants said. That's good. They know their statistics. Yes. Um, just to mention uh, before before we go, we um, there there are a lot of confounding variables as well. Um, Effective, so these are some of the activities that are available about blocking. We didn't have a chance to get to effective blocking. There's a great, it's a very similar activity we found uh, to the stratified activity, but it's from an experiment point of view called effective blocking. Um, there's some other uh, sampling and blocking activities for TI Inspire. And TI-84 activities, um, here there were some uh, chi-square distributions, central limit theorem, a sampling document there. Um, and it's using the rand int command, um, and they also could use the rand int and repeat, as we learned um, tonight on the 84. So there's lots of different options, no matter which calculator you have there, uh, to do some stats on the calculator where they're doing real uh, stuff and seeing the results. Um, uh, I thought this was fun uh, to do with Diane. Do you have any parting words for us or wisdom about blocking and um, confounding? I think that the activities make a real significant difference in my classroom. And allowing yeah. students to actually see what's happening, allowing them to do random sampling themselves like we did at the beginning, that's really made statistics become belong to my students instead of just belonging to me. Yeah, so yeah, that's really I think true. It, it's made things pretty much more successful for that for student understanding. Yeah. Yeah, that at stratified sampling activity is just wonderful for, for making those light bulb moments happen in the classroom, which is always a fun thing to do. Mike, can you take control? I sure can. So we're going to be, begin wrapping things up tonight. Uh, if you have any last minute questions for Diane and Jeff, uh, please try to get those asked. I know they'll do their best in the last uh, minute or two here to try and get some of those questions answered. We're excited to have the T-Cube International Conference coming to San Antonio in early March uh, this year, this coming year. Uh, it's really a great place, again, to uh, meet educators like Diane and Jeff and attend sessions on uh, confounding variables and spend a little more time maybe learning a little bit more about what uh, the difference between confounding variables and, say, lurking variables is um, because we really have a lot more time at the conference to explore those kind of things. Um, and right now there's, a, I know through mid-October, there's a pretty good savings on the conference. So if you're thinking about attending, uh, now is a great time to register and save some money. Um, Jeff mentioned earlier in the agenda that tonight we're giving away to one lucky winner uh, a conference registration. Uh, and that lucky winner tonight is David Allen. So, David, congratulations. We really hope to see you there as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that were used tonight by Diane and Jeff. And if you happen to be watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And if those links aren't working for you tonight, uh, don't worry, you'll automatically get a follow-up email within a couple days. In that follow-up email, you get a link to the certificate, a link to the documents, and a link to the recording. So thanks so much, uh, Diane and Jeff, for everything you shared tonight. It was uh, really engaging with all the polls. Uh, it was great to actually get some live feedback tonight uh, that's something that we typically don't do, so it was nice to use it tonight. So uh, thanks for everything you shared. Sure. Thanks uh, for having us. By the way, there was, there was a question about uh, they'd like to see what the AP said. You could look that up. It was from 1999, question number three, I believe. So uh, you click up the scoring guidelines for that. Um, uh, about the confounding, what did they say as far as the AP? We didn't have a chance to show that. Um,
Thanks. Enjoyed it. Thank you.